can have voice. See if BF can respond.
That's the trailer. They're all in that X port of All five of them. Five of them. Okay. Go ahead and... One of them just got out. I hear the call. Um, well, I hear some of the call. Stacy Gephardt took it, or Bishop, and she's screaming and yelling at somebody on the phone because the person on the phone is screaming and yelling at her, trying to get any information. It took a long time to figure out what was going on and who even it was. We were able to get Michael Johnson. So I'm standing behind the Royalton dispatcher. She does the search for Michael Johnson, Westminster, comes up zero. I said, try Bell's fault. End up getting who the victim is. Um, so it's Michael so, Johnson? Correct. 42177. It's from Bell's fault. He lives on Atkinson Street. Michael will be on that one. Michael Johnson. So who do we have? I, I'm dealing, I'm finishing up with a DUI. So I send 32 at Bloom and Lunderville. Lunderville's coming from Weston. Bloom from Springfield. I end up showing up first. Okay. So I show up. The old mother, uh, lady is on the uh, porch. Cecilia Alcock. C E C I L E S. Alcock. She's gibber. I'm like, what's going on? There's a guy dying in my house, blah, blah, blah. But she's standing right in the middle of the door. I'm like, you need to get out of the way so I can get inside. What took you so long? I called to it. So we. A little back and forth before I can get inside. I walk inside. There's two guys there. One of them's Lonnie. I think I see him second. I think I see, I think it's Mel Alcott first. Okay, Lonnie Alcott? No, I don't know Lonnie's last name yet. Okay. Lonnie's the boyfriend of Christine. Mel is the husband of Cecilia. Okay, so he's an Alcott? Correct. I walk down the hallway, the alleyway, I make a right, I take a step up, I make a left into what looks like a kitchen area, or a dining room area, excuse me. And on the floor is Michael J 
Johnson. And on the lower part of the chest is Christine applying pressure. She looks like she's applying pressure to something. And on the head of the side of the head um, is Ryan Alcott. Right. And they're both applying pressure. It looks like the same area. Right. Ryan is Christine's son. She's got three generations of Alcott. Everybody is just screaming and yelling, blaming me, and yelling for rescue. Now, we had rescue staged down the road. Ryan is... Um, Christine's son. Yeah, but Ryan is assisting, is trying to help Correct. Him. He's on the head side of Johnson, and both him and Christine are applying pressure to his wound. Yeah. Now, uh, there's very know. little blood on him at this point that I can see. I see a big puddle of blood under a table, which he's not near. And I see another puddle of blood lower down on his body, like where his thighs would be. Okay, but very little blood where the wound is or underneath his body where the wound is. And he's kind of on his, I don't want to say a 45 degree angle, but he's tilted up. I mean, he's not flat on the ground. Okay. So, Christine's yelling at me, get rescue, get rescue. I'm telling her rescue's needed to stage so we can make it safe, they're not going to show up, blah, blah, blah. We end up switching spots, Christine and I. So now I'm applying pressure to this wound. And so is Ryan. So Ryan and I are face to face. At this point, he's almost grayish. I'm staring at his carotid. There's no pulse that I can see. There's a, I can feel his heart moving a little bit, but it's definitely not the case. To me, he appears dead. I'm able to get out on my radio to tell them to have rescue come to tent home because it's, even though they're upset and irate, it's safe. I see a knife, a long, it's not like a steak knife, but almost like a chopping knife, up on the counter, or you'll see when you get in there, it's kind of like, I don't know, it runs the length of the dining room area opposite the table, but it's got nothing on it, it's just sitting there, and there's no blood, there's no stains, there's no anything, uh, and it does not look like it was the one that was used to stab him. But I don't see any other instruments around him at all. No other knives, no nothing. I didn't see any blood on any of these people either. A little blood on her from where she was um, kneeling in it to... Um, the, the original caller said that someone was stabbed. Christina came over to the right. original caller and said so someone had been stabbed. When I got in there, they said that he fell onto a knife. No bloody knife. Seen. Uh, no blood visible on any of them, even Ryan? I couldn't tell with Ryan because he was bent down right over top of the guy. And he's wearing all dark clothes. He's wearing a dark blue shirt. Or a coat. I think it was a coat. But she, Christina tells me that Johnson fell onto a knife and stabbed himself, fell and stabbed himself. She had anything else? Um, no, she's yelling that it took us two hours to get there and if he dies it's our fault. Why aren't we doing more? Okay. Ryan? Ryan, I ask him what happened in between his um, yelling episodes. He tells me that <clears throat> he sees his friend um, bleeding, and Michael told, tells him that he was stabbed by Lonnie. Um, I thought he said uh, Maury. Is what it Ryan says he sees his friend sees his friend bleeding.
Your best friend is bleeding. It's a bastard. Yes. Your best friend is bleeding. And he told him that, like I said, I thought he said Maury. But it turns out he said Lon- Lonnie. Lonnie told him? That Lonnie stabbed him. Michael Johnson said that. Michael, uh, that Lonnie stabbed him. Then he won't tell me anymore until we get medical people here. Okay. So have they all, uh, Lonnie's not talking? Lonnie won't talk to me. He just stepped out of the car about two minutes before you showed up to retrieve a charger from the other car that was next to him. So I got out, tried to talk to him. I said, can you talk to me? I don't know what you want me to say. Um, so they're cooperative in that if we ask them to get out of the vehicle, they're going to get out of the vehicle. We're not no, gonna, I don't think they're out. We're going to wrestle them out of the vehicle? Yeah. So he's got a cell phone with him? She does. And she's recording them. Okay. We had an incident down here maybe two weeks ago where an ex of hers was trying to get his belongings out of here, and it turned into the same fiasco. They wouldn't open the door for us. They wouldn't talk to us. They would scream and yell from the door. Um, Holden's been down there. He had to flop her one day. Uh, we've had yeah. So that's the type of people that we're dealing with. Um, I've tried to engage them three or four times to talk to them. They won't. Um, they'll roll down a little bit, then they'll say a few unkind words, and then they'll roll back up. I tried to prevent him from getting, not prevent, but I was kind of tugging at him to come talk to me. She's tugging him the other way, and finally he just ripped away from me and got back in the car. Buddy, I just want to talk to you about what happened. You're not in any trouble. Nice as pie, and that's the way it happened. So, okay. so they're in there probably can talk to you. Right. Now all of a sudden, uh, Ryan told Bryson a little more, um, and I told him to go back and write down what it was. He's watching this video and he's writing it down. Um, so that's when he told Bryson that he saw um, Lonnie punch what he thought was punch Mike in the chest. And then he sees Mike bleed and fall to the ground. Or vice versa. Then. And, um... The bill that he saw... He saw... Lonnie punch Mike in the chest. also means I don't want to get anybody in trouble. All right, so next time they get out, if they get out to take a charger or whatever, um, we're going to latch on to them and not let them return to the car. Um, we'll wait for some people to get here. Um, we obviously are going to detain all of them. Um, if they're not going to talk, then we've got to... We're going to detain them until such time we understand.